So Rex is, is coming up to lead this session. I'm just plugging in to be his scribe um, for the slides that we've prepared. Okay, great. So um, as is tradition at these meetings, we have tried to capture more or less in real time um, a summary of each of the sessions. And what we want to do is present the summary that we've captured back to you and <clears throat> have you tell us, A, is it approximately right? And B, are there major things that you heard that we should have captured that we did not? Does that sound reasonable to everybody? So the first session was really the basics of implementation science. And I thought it was really, for me, it was a really wonderful session. I mean, it really framed what it is that implementation science is all about. So I, I learned a lot. So uh, we, we, we heard about uh, defined implementation science, dissemination research, and implementation research, and each of those phases and how they play out. We learned about the timing of implementation research when the evidence is still evolving. And I thought that was a really important point that uh, we shouldn't just wait until we think we're ready and then implement. We should figure out how to implement as we go along. And I think I'm seeing some head shaking. So I, for me, that was a really important lesson. It, it's because we're probably never going to be ready. So we probably need to start right now. And um, the lessons from the Pronovost central line infection checklist, I, I also f that, I, I'd heard that before. but. Um, the idea that it needed to be modified at each site. So it wasn't about the checklist, but it was really about the process of getting to the checklist and how that led to a better understanding at each of the sites. Uh, we heard that there are dozens of models and frameworks, 106 or something, um, and can we work to develop a specialized inf implementation framework for genomic medicine? And I think the answer to that is yes, we probably can, um, we've got some examples of that. You know, Ignite is doing some of the work. Um, Caesar and Emerge are doing some work. We need to make sure those two are, are, get aligned, I think, uh, appropriately. Um, but then to think about, you know, is it Reaim? Re is it CFER? And maybe that's even not the right question to ask. Maybe it's about what are the right uh, processes at each place. And then we need to think about uh, novel ways to fund this research outside of the slow NIH processes, uh, maybe a clinical trials network kind of an approach. Um, I thought that was sort of an interesting idea to think about. Could we, uh, for example, amongst Emerge, Caesar, Ignite, all of those kinds of things, stand up a rapid response team that could help uh, respond as we start to think about implementation challenges? So a uh, couple more points on the basics of implementation. Uh, could we expand implementation science into a larger sphere than just existing medical care systems? So that included a uh, comment about direct-to-consumers. Uh, we think that's going to become an important, a more, more I, I won't say important, but a more influential um, factor going forward. And then can we leverage payers' decisions, such as reimbursing for MSI testing to accomplish other goals, such as getting to Lynch screen identification, uh, Lynch syndrome identification. So I think that was it for the basics of implementation science. So let me stop there and pause and ask, did we get anything wrong? And is there anything that we didn't include that we should have? OK, I'm hearing silence, so I'm assuming that we're, we're good to go. Session two was to talk about resources for genomic medicine implementation. Um, we need to identify common threads of genomic medicine implementation to build implementation guidelines. Uh, we saw a nice example, I think, of, of that in um, the work in the Ignite Spark program. Ignite Spark program, did I get that right? Yeah. Um, we need to think about some de-implementation guidance, such as for long QT variants no longer deemed to be pathogenic. We heard about that. Um, removing codeine from the pediatric formulary, we heard about that. Um, 
Payers paying for testing is a tiny fraction of the cost. We need to have a broader view of what the real cost of implementation is. And then the question raised is, do we really need a CPIC for non-PGX genes, especially for non-Mendelian conditions? So this also didn't, and I would encourage everybody, uh, we sort of did short shrift, obviously, to the CDC resources that are available to that since Moeen was unable to attend, but everybody should take a look at those slides. I think there's quite a bit of information in those slides, if, if you haven't already. So again, resources, um, maybe I should just add, because it, it's not captured here, is uh, there was a very nice discussion of what ClinGen is and what ClinVar is that I think was, is very helpful and um, there still continues to be, I think, significant confusion in the community about what e the role of each of those things is. So we, I think we still continue to have to do significant education ar around that. Again, additions, subtractions, modifications. One thing we didn't hear a lot about were other resources that that were needed. Um, you know, there there were lots of things about other partnerships and other efforts and and that we didn't hear a lot about other resources and and maybe you don't think of them now, but if you think of them later, let us know. Remember that there will be meeting summary prepared. My two colleagues have been busily taking notes and we'll write a beautiful uh, summary of that, so we'll capture more more detail. But um, but just kind of wanted to get the main points here. Yeah, and I, I would just comment that uh, a lot of the resource needs came out of this afternoon, uh, this morning session uh, on around the informatics. I think we heard loud and clear that there are a bunch of resources that are needed for that. So I, I just didn't comment because we were going to be getting to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So session three, we had. Uh, Several really great examples. Oh, sorry, Heidi. Sorry, just one quick thing to add. I, I missed the session, so um, it might not have been talked about, but it ra raised a point I just brought up a little while ago, which is a resource to access patient-level data, phenotypes and genotypes, that would, just doesn't exist today. And I think a federated network of sharing would be useful. And I think the other really important point, we talk a lot about standards that are critical, whether it be FHIR and, and, and others, the best way to standardize is to, to create a useful sharing environment. And the only way you can share data is your data looks like other people's. And that's happened in ClinVar. I've watched all of the clinical labs align into a common set of approaches to track information on variants because they're forced to, to format it that way to submit it to ClinVar. Um, so I think that thinking very strategically about data sharing, not just because it's an incredibly important thing, but it also forces very quickly standards. Instead of like taking years to develop standards with everybody having a different opinion, and, and then you put them out there, and then no one adopts oh, yeah, them. Yeah. If, if you just create a useful resource, bang, it, it quickly gets implemented the standards because you can't interact with this resource without being standardized. So just something to think about from a resource standpoint. I, I think very important, and I think given the discussion in the last hour about the importance of the phenome, that probably really emphasizes that, because probably the worst place we have for capturing standard information is about the phenome. All right, uh, so session three, we heard um, that phenotype risk scores uh, using EHR phenotype data to identify probable Mendelians. That, we thought that was a really uh, impressive use of uh, electronic health records data. So how do we think about developing and disseminating, and maybe this builds a little bit on the question of what, what kind of tools do we need that would actually uh, standardize that? And we, we, we heard a little bit in Lisa's presentation about um, you know, how she went about doing that and her colleagues at Vanderbilt. So. Um, we need a comparison of weekly expenditures in advanced cancer care. We heard about this um, from Lincoln, uh, that it's an extremely useful metric and that uh, every category, nearly every category, was reduced except drug costs. So they set about trying to create a drug procurement team to try to address that. And I thought that was a really novel uh, approach. Can we develop and share a 
uh, attractive data portals. So there's a lot of discussion about what uh, that an interface that's usable and maybe not as clunky as some of the ones that like our electronic health records that people have to interact with uh, might be a, a useful uh, tool um, to create uh, portals for both clinicians and for patients. Um, to develop a genome patient registry similar to cardiovascular data registry. Uh, and again, I think this might be a step in the direction, Heidi, that, of what you, you were just talking about. And then uh, try to really do more with patient reported outcomes. Um, we heard this morning from folks that the hospital systems listen to their patients. They, it, if your system is like my system, they're constantly driven by, you know, likeliness to recommend and all of these kinds of metrics that uh, really drive, I think, uh, hospital CEOs. So patient reported outcomes are really very important to them and how can we uh, put genomic medicine as part of that. So, um, other things that we didn't, uh, and especially those that presented them, I'm happy to hear more. Uh, my, my only comment about the, the portals, because we talk about this all the time, how do we, you know, get the patient engaged and also the clinicians, and I agree the EMR is clunky, but as soon as you tell pa uh, physicians to go outside of the okay. EMR, they're not going to use it. and um, so. That doesn't mean it can't look like it's in the EMR, because there's certainly a lot of things that we do in EPIC in our system that it really isn't EPIC, but it kind of looks like it's in EPIC. And then on the patient side, as a health system hat on, you know, we don't want necessarily our patients going to five different portals to get information about that. It needs to have a unified theme, because it's not just genomics, okay, I'm gonna go look at this, but they need to know what they, you know, what their, you know, cardiovascular, what their, you know, nutritional support is, or, you know, in terms of the dietitian, it has to be integrated somehow and still have the experience that the health system is owning it, even though the data may be coming from different cells. So I just wanted to have that comment. Okay, in there. thanks. Bob? It, if I could build on that just for one moment, I'd like to emphasize the, the need in order to accomplish what was just outlined. We need the ability to help incentivize the standardization of APIs across these systems that needs to be a, uh, developed by centralized authorities like HL7, et cetera. It needs to be adopted by vendors and it needs to be open to the point where the innovators that are, that are working on developing new applications and new uses for these data are able to build on top of those and extend the, the functionality in, in new and interesting ways. And this gets to the conversation too about having some sort of um, statement or something about, you know, PHA and cover, because again, there was a conversation earlier, like one lawyer will say one thing, we're, we're having the same thing, and, you know, we looked at what all of us is declaring as PHA now, and we're revisiting, well, our review from a few years ago, because it's different from the, you know, the position our internal counsel took a while ago, and so it's this back and forth that can, can, can paralyze a system. Yeah, and as we've heard multiple times, you know, Data sharing is key, and so we can't be paralyzed by unreasonable limitations on data sharing. All right. Uh, we had our really fun, and I thought not only fun but enter and entertaining, but sort of really effective debate that brought out a lot of really interesting issues that I, I think we can think about. Uh, geneticists still largely make diagnoses and refer back for management, so the Primary care providers have to be involved. Um, So-called catch and release, <laughs> which I found an interesting uh, way to think about it. Um, there are rare serious disorders which are, have got to be the realm of the trained gen genetics because they're complicated, they're ra not likely to be seen in a lot of primary care settings. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, pharmacogenomics and uh, not really being the realm of geneticists, maybe not being really the realm of primary care physicians and maybe should be the realm of pharmacists, but uh, I thought interesting discussion ar around that. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, shifting more of the genetics care to genetic counselors. Um, the problem is there are a limited number of them and I, I, th I think certainly at our place we've doubled the size of our genetic counseling program and still 
everybody gets a job before they graduate. So it's, it's a, if you want, have friends that are looking for a career, it's a great career. Um, and I think the other thing that is key here is we need to figure out how to bill for that because right now the billing for genetic counseling is probably a little on the broken side or maybe not even existent. Um, we need to develop limited training for the majority of common complex diseases. So maybe we have to have training programs that allow people, primary care providers, to get certified as uh, sort of experts in a particular area. And the point was made, it doesn't make sense for every primary care provider to do that and just wait for some rare um, person to come into their office, but rather maybe what we can use is the primary care providers that have had this additional certification as extenders to the genetics, the trained genetics workforce, so that hospital by hospital, hospitals that don't really have these resources might at least have somebody that could know when it's important to refer and when it might be able to be handled locally. Um, we talked about seeding relevant specialties with the needed information uh, beyond the primary care providers. And then uh, the question came up, can some of the diagnostics, and we just had a little nice discussion about that, be done by AI? Often the genome reveals along with, the answer along with the line of clinicians, including geneticists. So, you know, the idea of, Alexi, tell me what's wrong with me, <laughs> it, it's, is, an interesting, is an interesting and maybe not too crazy idea that we should be thinking about. What? <laughs> I think that's it. Were there enough uh, conditionals there? Hmm. So Mark, Mark is raising his hand. Mark, subtly. Yep. So there are a number of bullets here that I think relate to an uh, overarching theme that, that would be important to take away, at least from my perspective for implementation, which is we really need innovative care delivery models. We can't default to the way we usually do things. And so in some ways, having a bullet saying, well, we need more genetic counselors, Yes, but we also need to explore other types of care providers like genomic medicine assistants and advanced practice nurses and that that can, you know, serve in different roles. We also need to, um, you know, AI is mentioned from a diagnostic perspective, but I think there's a lot of other things um, that uh, Cadre is working on as part of ClinGen about information delivery and, and removing, you know, humans from the equation in many cases where it's really not needed because of the nature of the information. So, you know, something that just reflects a broader uh, potentially researchable agenda about innovative care deliveries to support genomic medicine. Okay, th thanks. Any, so I think that was it for, the, the, any other questions, comments, additions on that topic? I, I would just add with what Mark said though, to make uh, the innovative care models that includes innovative and new models of care f and utilization of genetic counselors. So perhaps, you know, maybe it's the um, economy of scale of a couple of genetic counselors doing laboratory utilization versus the one-on-one -on -one pre hour-long pre-test genetic counseling. That, so innovative care models, just making sure that includes innovative care models for genetic counseling as well. Well, Jeff, really for, oh. all, for all aspects, though. I mean, it's for the yes. laboratory, it's for everything, right? Jeff? I think we heard, um, Gail talk about the fact that medical students hear about genomics in like the first two weeks of medical school and then it's like virtually absent. Um, and so how do we, I guess the question is uh, for this topic is how do we make sure that the primary care community is really prepared to take on their role in genomic medicine? I, I think, I, I guess I, I would just, so at our place it is true that if you look at lectures that are labeled, you know, genetics or genomics. It, it wasn't even as extensive as what Gail showed. But if you look at the pre presentations in uh, cardiology or in cancer, there's a lot of genetics and genomics that happens in those contexts. So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm just saying we need to, it, it, it's not just you know, lectures that are labeled genetics. We just need to make, there's make sure there's appropriate training throughout the life cycle of a medical student's training. There needs training. to be a thread and, and actually the practical aspects of it and when you get into practice of how do you even order a test, you know, all the things that we've probably yeah. talked about in implementation is 
um, is, is somewhat lacking from, uh, and, and I think should be on the agenda. Uh, greatly lacking. Uh, again, at our place, the concept of genetics is mostly genomics. There's no, po is mostly Mendelian genetics. There's no, almost no population genetics at all in our program. So it's a, it's a real weakness. Sorry, that takes a while. All right, uh, session four this morning, uh, EHRs and implementation. So I think we heard a really nice presentation about how improving CDSs is limited by the lack of both institutional evidence, institutional su acceptance uh, of supporting evidence, um, and then that the CDS architecture itself varies, so it sometimes creates a barrier between uh, individual, uh, for, at individual sites. Um, there's a tension between operational IT and those terrible researchers going in and mucking up with the um, operational IT system. So I, it's, I think we've all experienced that at, at our various sites. Um, we th need to think about a defined framework of stakeholders, transactions, and clinical systems and how those interact to better in, uh, use uh, better use uh, uh, the electronic health records and clinical decision support, and the great opportunity of using clinical decision support for patient screening. Uh, I think that's a really important uh, activity going forward that would help us better do clinical trials and get better evidence for a variety of things. Uh, we heard a lot of discussion about the needs to standardize technology, variant specifications, uh, we heard about some systems that are really important resources, including FHIR. Uh, we heard about the HL7 Clinical Genomics Workgroup, which is likely to bring forward some important information to help us going forward. We heard about the importance of the ClinGen NCBI allele registry and how we need to integrate that, and, and, and I think maybe now is a good time to say and make sure we're integrating it with the phenotype as well. Um, Dan keeps talking about adding a phenotype column, and I think it's a really important um, contribution. Um, we, we heard again from several people the need to embrace a common data model. Can we, how do we go about doing that? Um, and then we also heard, though, that the, everybody wants to use a common data model, but the problem is everybody wants to use their common data model, and so we need to come to some agreement about what the common data model might, might be. We heard about Odyssey, um, and I think uh, I, th I think it was uh, Chris who said, but maybe it was maybe it was uh, maybe it was Larry said that uh, Fire really may be the ultimate CDM specification uh, using some kind of a pluripotent data model. So uh, maybe there's even hope that there's a target that we could be driving towards uh, going forward to that. I think that was it for EHRs. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure people will want it add or subtract to that. Gil? Um, I was just going to add that uh, one of the things that I, I thought was kind of a nice development is the uh, domain analysis model document for clinical sequencing and then more, more recently the clinical genomics because it has a, basically a standard list of the use cases in genomics. So it's like for the first time we can talk about, okay, here's a standard use case and its workflow and so forth, and, and uh, I've seen that being used by not just institutions, by national programs, by other consortiums, so that, that might be something to know. Yeah, and if I can um, add to that, so I agree with, with that resource, it's a, it's a really good resource. I would say that the one thing I didn't see up there was this notion of establishing a uh, a community-driven policy-making, uh, decision-making kind of committee to do things like validate that HL7 use case document. I, I was there, I, you know, I was there for a lot of sessions of how those things get created, and there's, there's more experts in this room than combined of what was used to make that. So that gives you a sense. It's, it's not, it's good. I'm not trying to knock it. It's just, I think you guys want to have a group out there that blesses it and says, this is good and we agree with it. That will get more people to engage with it and adopt it quicker. So anything you can do along that lines to get that going would be really fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Chris isn't here, so I'll uh, channel him. I think he would uh, say that we've got our uh, nomenclature confused a bit. Uh, I think what he was really saying was that while there are common data models that are out there, what we want to do is to move away from a common data model and to use uh, data elements, uh, which is somewhat captured in the FIRE uh, bullet. Uh, FIRE may be the ultimate common data model specification. I don't think he would say it exactly that way. I think what he would say is, is that it's a pluripotent data model that actually uh, allows for much more flexibility than our traditional approach of using a common data model. So I think that's the takeaway that I had from his presentation in particular, and I, I happen to agree with him. I'm not sure if that's uh, agreement among the, the majority of our other informatic experts here. The second thing that I didn't see represented there, uh, again, reflects comments that I made during the strategic planning uh, talk, which was uh, Gil's presentation about the patient-facing aspects uh, of that. I think th that some of it is a, a little bit implied, but uh, I, I heard that as being much more um, explicit in terms of how we can actually use FIRE as a patient engagement tool around genomic medicine. Okay. Yep. If I could just add one point to what Mark just said about the common data model and the data elements. One of the challenges that we have in spades right now is that when we have a problem that's related to data sharing, that needs to get solved. It's typically because it's on some sort of timeline. We have a project, we have a grant, we have some sort of need to exchange data. And the way that that happens is two parties or a small handful of parties get together and they come up with the common data model that's going to work for that research network or that whatever it is. And they come up with a solution and it gets the job done and that's great, but it's fit for purpose. It's relatively short time, time uh, uh, lifespan and it doesn't really go beyond that. What we need collectively is a longer term, more sustainable uh, thought process about how we develop those Lego building blocks, those common data elements that are going to provide the common semantics for how we can exchange these data elements for a much longer period of time. One of the challenges in genomics is the rapidity with which the domain evolves. And we cannot be in a situation where we're continually having to redesign our data models every time we come up with a new use for this data, or we are never going to get anywhere. So, so how would we go about doing that? It's a challenge. <laughs> it, it's not easy. If it, if it were, we would have been done 10 years ago. Um, one of the, the so I, I mentioned the challenge about the fit for purpose and the, the fact that the drivers for a lot of these efforts are typically relatively short in terms of lifespan compared to what we're really needing in this domain, which is a much longer, more stable platform of data elements that we can build off of. One of the challenges, and I, I think I'll look to my other colleagues in the SDOs that, that can perhaps speak to this, one of the challenges that we have is that when we have participants coming to the table to help us develop these things as part of a more formal process, everyone comes with their own use cases and their own objectives in mind of what they want to accomplish. And it takes a tremendous amount of effort to take those specialized use cases, generalize them so that they apply far beyond those, those driving uh, projects, and then make sure that we have enough uh, common understanding about what we're trying to represent that it will stand the test of time. That is extremely labor intensive. It involves conversations that literally last for hours if not days. Larry's probably laughing over there at me. But it, it's absolutely true. And so I, I think being able to take the time to breathe and to have those conversations will allow us to develop standards that will be much longer lived than some of the ad hoc standards that we have today. And I think at the risk of maybe s saying what's obvious, uh, m my guess is that there's probably an implementation science approach that could be applied to how to actually develop that. Yeah, that's right. And I, I want to, Bob made it sound like so big that you guys might not want to even touch it. So I want to try to go uh, and say that th I think the approach that I would take is that with this whole domain, there are parts of that model that we've spent enough time on now that are getting pretty solid. And the part is getting it over the goal line so people can start using it. And that's what I think we should be doing. Just like you do in a software project when you're getting requirements, 
you sort of you get the requirements, and then when the requirements get solid enough, you you say, okay, we're we're ready to risk development resources on actually building this piece because it's it's stable enough, and we can then develop on it. That's, that's sort of what we have to do here, and, and there are parts that are close to the goal line. We just need to push them over the end, and, and we need a little bit of investment to a little bit. You know, we need investment to get it over that goal line, and then build on the successes. Any, anything else on, on the EHR? I was going to add one more. It's just that um, tools for uh, supporting tools for learning from others. So whether that's artifacts or um, uh, webinars to share lessons learned, and and also uh, the um, areas for trying out um, decision support before it's actually implemented. Hey, talk for a while, Rex. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was about, about trying to m make more tools available to people to think about um, how to share. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece was uh, clinical decision support, somehow a, a, a test platform for before it goes live. A sandbox, as it were. Yeah. Right, I think we can move. So then, um, session five this morning, I just found fascinating, and I hope all of you found it as fascinating as I did. It, it completely flipped my way of thinking about this. So the title of the session was like, you know, how, how much evidence do we need? And the message that I heard from the folks here is, we need to stop worrying about evidence. We've got evidence. We just need to figure out how to use it. So um, we're going to stop thinking about deficits in evidence. We're going to continue to develop more evidence, but we're, we're not going to be held hostage by, oh, you don't have enough evidence yet. The other thing I thought just completely revolutionized my way of thinking about this is, you know, we've been thinking about, oh, we need to get the payers on board. And I thought the case was so compellingly made today that that's not the right question. The right question is, how do we get the em people that are sub the employers on board? Um, so that um, they're, you know, they're representing their employees, and we heard they're motivated to actually do the right thing for their employees. And oh, by the way, if you have the big picture of things, it's probably going to save some money. So I, I, I found that just, uh, again, uh, I think it really, we should really be thinking about building on that. And um, so, for example, we need to think about uh, research that shows the employers benefit from adoption of genomic medicine. And the other thing that came out of that is we, we probably should, it, whether it's one of these meetings or a smaller meeting, need to convene a group of employers and really understand this even better than we understood it today, and maybe including believers and then maybe some non-believers who might be brought along as I believers in, in the course of that discussion. And then the other lesson I think that came out very clearly, uh, or need that came out very clearly of the uh, discussion this morning was, or this afternoon I guess it was, the need to develop a basic genomics formulary. And um, there is already um, an example that was generated several years ago now mm -hmm. um, in the UK, probably needs some updating, but maybe we can even think about start that as a starting point to think about what a basic genomics formulary might look like. So I'll stop there and does this capture what's missing? Pat. Yeah, so I, w I would just have a little bit more, my impression was a little bit more nuanced with evidence, ex evidence exists, stop focusing on it. And I see, um, Terry, that you already put a little parenthetical in there. I think if we're going to, disintermediate the payer and go directly to the employer. There still need evidence. I heard lots of examples from Jay of where peer-reviewed publication was persuasive. So I think it's the timing of the evidence. They may have a lower th threshold for um, wanting to implement than payers who tend to focus on clinical utility. And, and so I, I would just say that it's still important. 
but it's how it's packaged, for example, whether we include indirect costs, which would be very important, but typically most of our economic evaluations focus on direct healthcare costs. And the other piece that I think is missing um, is I also heard that consumers are another important audience, and they are gonna drive mm. a lot of the Absolutely. decisions around genomic yeah. medicine. So it's not just skipping over the payers and focusing on purchases, but there's gonna be a lot of pull through from consumers who ultimately are all patients at some point in their lives. Right. Right, and that we need to also focus on, on them. And then I heard a lot of agreement around sort of a major barrier, not just being um, lack of reimbursement, which we kind of have always heard, but the, that, that whole uh, need to educate the, everyone involved in the implementation process. Um, otherwise, all of this wonderful evidence is gonna fall flat. Okay. Just real, real quick to say that the, you know, the evidence thing, I think, um, the first statement makes sense, at least what we heard, but it makes sense to me in the context where pockets are deep. Uh, in the context where pockets are not deep, which is a lot of medicine, um, I think that uh, having the evidence, the scientific evidence, is still a good concrete milepost that we can hold out to people, uh, payers or whomever, to um, get them on board. I, yeah, I, I, I just want to make it clear. I don't think we were trying to say we don't need to continue to gather evidence. Um, I think it's just we need to make sure we're not held hostage by some sense that we don't have evidence. Uh, Mark? The one other perspective that I heard um, that, of course, wasn't, wasn't represented here, but we do still have issues on the public payer side with Medicaid and Medicare where uh, the traditional uh, rules of engagement still uh, hold and for which uh, there's still a huge uh, percentage of the American public that is funded under those programs. So that's something yeah. that needs to be considered, although I think that's probably the toughest of the nuts to crack, unfortunately, because it encompasses one of the issues that Bob raised, which is they don't have deep pockets, uh, and there's an inherent conservatism in terms of the uh, things that they do. Now, the one point that I would make in, you know, in contradiction, perhaps, to Bob is that um, the reality, much as I uh, made the comment that clinicians use evidence as a canard to say, I just don't want to change things, uh, in many cases, payers use uh, evidence as a canard for things that they don't want to deal with or pay for. Uh, the example I always uh, love to use when I talk to insurers is to say, you know, you hit us about evidence, evidence, evidence. When KRAS came out for, um, I, I, I can never remember which ab it is, a Cetuximab or whatever, um, you guys all covered that overnight because you realized that with that one test, you could not give this expensive medication to 90%. So you used a very different criteria of your evidence level for something that's going to save you a ton of money. So let's not, you know, let's <laughs> understand that there's a certain hypocrisy here. So, um, you know, we do need to uh, recognize that we have to have venues where we can really honestly talk about um, are we really talking about evidence or are we really talking about the risk, the financial risk that people, that payers have about being out in front of the curve and paying for things that are in fact highly unlikely to return value. But the reality is, is that a lot of what they pay for uh, in healthcare now that doesn't have an ohm associated with it is also not delivering value. I completely agree. And, and I think it's probably important to say that it's not always the case that um, Medicaid and Medicare are the last to adopt. They're often actually the first, and so um, there's maybe hope there. If we can get private payers to adopt because their empl employee-based systems are telling them to, that'll also help on the public side. Uh, let's keep going. Alana? So I wanted to just remind her that it's not, so my, I guess my issue with the, um, the stop focusing on the evidence is the what kind of evidence. Um, just because it's happening doesn't mean no evidence is being generated. So can we, what kind of evidence do we need? Can we, how can we utilize the evidence that is being generated? So this bullet need to, need research showing employers benefit from adoption, what we were talking about in that session. They're generating evidence, so let's use that evidence. And how do we how do we take the research and the information from that evidence? It's from the people that are clinically implementing, finding those places that are generating evidence, the direct to consumer industry. What evidence can we get from it? 
So obviously I was being a little too glib, yes, I no, guess, that's in okay. my I statement, but it impacted me. Heidi? <clears throat> So the bullet on we should convene a group of employers, so I think it's more than convene. I think, you know, unlike the healthcare systems that are part of the academic community that are used to publishing and have stati statisticians and looking at data, I don't, the, the motivations for the employers is a little different and I'm not sure that they have access to the, or motivations to get this data published and put it out there. and so. You know, and I was talking to Eric at lunch about this. Is there a way that NHGRI could could fund an, a resource of and a group of people that could actually work with the employers and help them ensure they're you know rolling things out in a way that the data can be captured, you know, have the expertise to do the statistics and the analyses on it and get it published, and then they have the as Jay you know the papers to point to to actually justify what they're doing and get it rolled out further, but. You know, just convening them in a two-day meeting and then sending them off, yeah, I'm not sure yeah. is enough to actually really make use of what is likely to be an incredible resource I of think, data. I think that's a really <laughs> important point. I, I would also say that we, um, one of the things that we heard uh, relative to healthcare system adoption of uh, genomic medicine was they often rely heavily on consultants. And so I think it was maybe Jeff uh, who recommended maybe we should think about um, using the resources available broadly in NHGRI as a consulting team that could go in and provide additional uh, support to the people that are at least willing to consider implementation. If I, if I can respond to Heidi's comment, um, I would hazard a guess that with the exception maybe of Klesson um, and uh, the NIH, NIH folks, we all work for employers that are self-insured academic medical centers are for the most part self-insured. We have a mission of academic, we have an academic mission. I think that there's alignment to look at those and say, hey, we're in the publishing business anyway, why not take a look at this? Yeah, I think about, I mean, this motivated me to go back, talk to my CEO about the, their, you know, 8,000 employee uh, health system that we should be talking about this with. To Heidi's point too, I think there's an opportunity here as uh, you know, narrow networks take you know hold of, of areas in terms of you know different health systems. Certainly in the Chicago land, that's something with a lot of um, you know um, large organizations that um, have their headquarters and are in the creation of those. But there could be a perfect opportunity for that. And I, I can say that uh, there are a couple of projects I know that are going on at our place. Uh, that are doing just that, working with, like, for example, Boeing and some of the larger employers in the, to actually think about how can we do more preventive care to actually help, and so this would fit in perfectly. Yeah, sorry, one more th uh, thing. The other thing that Jay referenced is the idea that, you know, uh, uh, self-employed insurers are already aggregating together uh, to tackle issues like purchasing power and um, uh, sharing uh, quality improvement metrics and those sorts of things. There would be the potential for um, taking, you know, an idea that Jeff had uh, proposed about, you know, creating this um, uh, genomed type of thing within a consortium of self-employed insurers where there is richer data and that they would actually serve as the consortium that would pull that data together to define outcomes and, and do that. So it wouldn't always fall on, you know, the uh, resources that are, um, um, you know, uh, limited from NHGRI and, and I have a delimited uh, time frame. So it's another interesting model to potentially explore. So I think, Gil, are you next, I think? Are you? Okay, Robert. Yeah, I, I just think we should be very careful about some of this sentiment because I really think that NIH and NHGRI and, and the academic traditions of evidence generation are a kind of bulwark against um, overenthusiasm, marketing, and so forth. And I don't think, I mean, certainly a, a Geisinger or a self-insured academic center is one thing, but um, a, a self-insured company, for the most part, doesn't have the resources, traditions, thinking processes, skill sets to, to generate the kind of what we call evidence. So um, absolutely, let's, let's reward and cheer on early adopters. Let's encourage, you know, experience with evidence generation at all levels. 
But let's, let's reserve for NHGRI the, the focus on the highest levels of evidence, the most rigorous methodologies. I, I hear in this, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just hearing it and it's not true, but I'm hearing in this a kind of, I don't know, rush to um, reward experience rather than rigor. And I just want to... Yeah, so, since I was sort of the author of that, I, that was not the intention. The intention was, I, I was just struck by the fact that None of them said, we, we don't have, it, it, the evidence was a problem. Not, I mean, not that we can't always have more and it can't be better. And so that, I, I, I'm guilty. I hear everybody saying I mean, just, that I overstated it. Yeah, I, okay, I, but I just, just as NHGRI, I mean, they funded people who looked at things that the world was saying the world was not ready for. NHGRI has to be ready to fund things that say, wait a minute, you know, because, because it's marketed, because it's adopted, and because people like it, it may not be effective. I mean, it's, it's got to be, be able to reserve that sense of equipoise in both directions. Good point. What else? We're now down. We're now to two slides. So. Yeah. So, um, oh, I'd forgotten we weren't done with that. that okay. No, uh, no it, it, it was one slide. Oh, okay. I just made it two okay. while you so were talking. Let, yeah. <laughs> because of all the adjustments that people good right. suggested. All right, so let's move uh, on. Um, we had, a, I thought, a really good discussion about uh, the NHGRI strategic plan, and there will be, this is just, this is just the beginning, folks. So but we heard some uh, interesting ideas about can we develop partnerships with regulatory agencies and payers to clear needs of priorities for evidence generation. So again, we're not done with evidence generation. Uh, are we shifting? Are we shifting goals of research from high-value publications to convincing payers? Um, and, and I think we've heard even in the discussion just now that we need to continue to do high-value publications as well. Um, we need to define what NHGRI can own and not what it can just partner with. That was a pretty strong theme. We need economic studies for preemptive testing. Um, and we've all uh, dabbled in thinking about the economics and know that we're not trained to do that, so we really need to get some people that are involved. We need improved standards, standardization of genome-related phenome questions. I think we've talked already uh, quite a bit about that. Um, we need to increase emphasis on the last mile problem of the clinician interacting with the patient. and. We heard not to forget the babies. So what is not here that should be, or what needs to be adjusted? The second to last bullet, um, again, I think it reflects a traditional way of thinking. I think it's really the patient interacting with the clinician. And again, I think, you know, one of the points was made is that we need to be more patient focused. I didn't see that, you know, come through um, and, uh, in terms of some of the uh, of the comments that that, um, that, that I made. Um, there was one other thing, um, but I'll think on it. And I, I think, uh, Bruce, you were one of the people that made the comment about the last, the, the need to deal with the last mile. Last mile, last mile doesn't have to be that a clinician interacts with the patient. It could be direct interaction with individuals. And then the other point that w was the medicine-based evidence. Um, oh, yeah. That's yeah. I also heard some comments that were made about the longitudinal use of the data and being able to have infrastructure to be able to use the genomic information over a lifetime or have ways to be able to access the information from multiple different points, as well as beyond just the interaction between the clinicians and the patient, ways of utilizing technology to be able to make the information more accessible to patients in general and involving them more in the process of care and as well as using that same type of technology to be able to look at ways to impact many of the points that are labeled here as far as the care process and implementation, thinking about the actual process itself and are there ways that we can use technology in place of the way that we currently uh, implement genomic medicine. Other comments or, or thoughts? Yeah, I'm not quite seeing either to the, the um, I don't know if this is what's meant by the, the last mile, those longer term 
outcomes of the impact of genomic medicine. Yeah, I think the last mile pro no, the, the last, last mile problem was something else. That it's about uh, the interaction. The encounter, really. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so say what you just said again. You're, you're the, the, the longer term outcomes of implementate of implementing genomic medicine. Yeah. The longer term impact on patients, on providers, and how they how to improve their use over time through the engagement so. with them. I'll fix it in a second. Yeah. Okay, any, anything else? So I, I think um, this has been very helpful and I'm glad to get all of the feedback and re revisions. Um, we're traditionally from these meetings, we try to generate a manuscript. Um, we will think about what that might look like. Uh, one idea that Terry had suggested was to go back and look at the GM1 meeting manuscript and to, to see what the world looks like um, a few years later. And I think that might be an interesting construct to think about the, the outcome of, of what we've talked about at, at this meeting. So um, we'll, we'll think on it, we'll seek some input, we'll get the, this um, summary out to you as well as some additional summary notes that have been taken. Um, and I just want to say, I, you know, I, we, when we started organizing this meeting, it was, it was sort of like, hmm, what are we going to do for GM11? Um, but um, I hope you have found this as uh, informative and sort of eye-opening as, as I have. It's, I, I think it's been really terrific, and it really gets to the foundations of what it is to do genomic medicine implementation. So uh, thank to, thanks to all of you for your a, sticking around to the really bitter end, um, and then also to all your input during this, and we look forward to figuring out what the next steps are. So thank you all, and I don't know. And also special thanks to Teji Rocker Burris, Absolutely. Julia Walker, um, and um, uh, Cam Camilla, um, <laughs> Cecilia, and Gabe. Uh, yeah, I, I read too much about the Royals, um, and, <laughs> and also uh, Kiara and, and Alvaro, who will be putting together the uh, the videos from and our, our AV colleagues from the hotel. Um, we'll, we'll be putting together the, the videos, and they'll they'll end up on the genomic medicine uh, working group webpage of NHGRI uh, in the meetings section. So probably within the next two weeks or so, they'll be there. Um, in terms of a, of a paper, typically what we've done is to have people who were presenters and moderators um, be sort of the, the co-authors in, in that. If people feel that's not right, let me know and we'll, you know, we'll see if we can expand that a bit. Um, and I did want to make sure, Teji, did you send around uh, the slides for Moeen Curry? Did those get? Oh, okay, great. So, so those will come out to you so you, you'll see what, uh, what resources there are um, for, for him. And, um, and I would, Eric, any closing thoughts from you? Uh, thanks to you. Thanks to you, Rex. Uh, Terry, of course, is thanks to Terry, but she's on, on the home she's team. She's at the root of everything, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rex, uh, for helping to co-chair this workshop with the entire uh, Genomic Medicine Working Group, who were instrumental in organizing it, and to everybody for participating. Great. All right. Now we can applaud. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. And those of you that are staying for the meeting, we'll see you around. And those of you that are traveling, safe travels home. <laughs>